Joining us from Washington this morning, Major Garrett, who's correspondent for the National Journal. Journal Major, always nice to have you with us. So as we look at this, one month in now on these protests, th there seems to have been a little bit of a shift among politicians in the way that they are reacting and reacting uh, to these protests and even embracing them. Who right now seems to be embracing these protesters and their movement? Well, the first thing I would say, Erica, is that it would be dangerous for Washington, anyone in Washington, Republican or Democrat, to say they were there first. The protesters know they were there first, that this appears to be, in general, a very organic movement. You don't have something happening in 140 or more cities in the United States without it having some general grassroots organic nature to it. So it's going to be very difficult for anyone in Washington to credibly jump in and wrap its arms around it. Having said that, Democrats are trying to associate themselves more with this frustration and tap into it as a political lever, possibly, in 2012, Republicans are keeping their distance, at least so far. You mentioned being careful about just how closely or exactly how they align themselves. You don't want to try to take credit for something, obviously, that, that you didn't do. Is there also some concern, though, among politicians about embracing the movement in general? Are they worried that it could backfire? Politicians are always scared about volatility in American political life and quite clearly there is at least some component of these protests that has an element of volatility to them generally and I would say almost entirely they have been peaceable there's been substantial communication between the protesters and cities across the country and their local police there have been some exceptions to that when we hear in London talk in Europe about a revolutionary movement I don't think there's anyone in America talking about revolution what they're talking about is some degree of maybe Primal screams a bit too uh, <laughs> impassioned a metaphor, but a sense of speaking for your own economic future. That seems to be what's at the core of this, and politicians would like to know what they're asking for before they can uh, adequately respond. So that desire to have, to have a voice, as you say, there's still that question about what exactly the message is, so many different people involved here. Um, where, though, does the movement go from here? So one month in, clearly some in Washington are starting to hear those voices. How do they leverage that? Well, that's the next big step, and the protesters are beginning to understand that, that there is a rapacious desire here in Washington to have someone say, just tell me what you want, and then I'll try to satisfy you, either with a speech or a piece of legislation. Well, these protesters don't know exactly what they want. Some would like foreclosure relief. Some would like student debt relief. Some would simply like jobs. Some would like unemployment benefits. Some would like an end to or a reduction in defense spending. It's a wide array of agenda items. I would actually say, Erica, based on what I've seen so far, that's not necessarily a weakness that draws a lot of people together. And when you're drawn together, you get attention. Leveraging that attention is a big problem for the protesters, but Washington is beginning to turn its eye warily toward what's happening in the streets. Major Garrett, good to have you here this morning. Thank you. My pleasure.